So greetings everyone and welcome to the 58th session of the online Optom learning series OOLS. Let me introduce to you our speaker for today. It's actually a very, very early good morning to our speaker joining in all the way from the US and greetings, good evening and good afternoon for, for people from India and uh, Malaysia and whatever part of the world you belong to, greetings. Today we have uh, Dr. Morrison today with us and she's an optometrist who owns a specialty contact lens private practice in Arizona. The name is Focus Specialty Contact Lens and Vision Solutions. She graduated from the New England College of Optometry and further there she completed a cornea and contact lens residency at the Sunny College of Optometry in New York City. Before she moved back to Arizona, she worked in the cornea department of the New York Eye and Ear uh, Mount Sinai specializing in corneal diseases. Her specialty and her passion mm -hmm. is helping patients who suffer from severe ocular conditions and disfigurement and making them confident in their vision once again. And today she is going to talk to us about very interesting applications of soft contact lenses. So welcome uh, Doc onto our platform and I would leave the screen time to you now. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you so much everyone for joining me and thank you uh, Fakrudin for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks so much for everyone for joining in. I know it's a little bit late where you are. Um, definitely early for me, which is crazy to think how different uh, time zones we are, but um, hopefully you'll get something interesting out of this. This is um, a fairly large part of my practice is interesting soft contact lenses. Um, I wasn't originally starting out thinking that I was going to do a lot of these soft contact lenses. Um, I thought, you know, sclerals, GPs, just the, the kind of things that you expect when you get keratoconic patients, corneal transplants. But um, this is something that I actually get referred to quite a bit now, which is uh, really fun and interesting. So um, join along with me and I'll give you some information about them. So basically we are optometrists, um, some of you are students, but you know, eventually at some point you will master the basics. You probably already mastered the basics of soft contact lens fitting. Um, we can correct refractive errors, um, multifocal contact lenses, monovision contact lenses. Um, we know how to fit them around our patient's eyes so that they're comfortable and seeing well. Um, but there are some other things that soft contact lenses can do that are very interesting. So if you want to level up, um, this is a great place to start. So these are just some pictures of some different contact lenses, obviously scleral, a prosthetic. Um, this prosthetic on the left is one that I fit for a patient with a keratoprosthesis and he was really happy. So um, this lecture will cover some uh, applications of soft contact lenses, uh, including migraine relief, light sensitivity, um, people who want to cover some ocular disfigurements, and a way to enhance color vision in color deficient people, um, and correcting vertical diplopia, among a couple other things. Um, if you have questions throughout the lecture, just post them in the notes and um, either Bakrudin will ask me during the presentation if it's relevant or we'll just save everything to the end. Hopefully I can get to every one of them. Um, so the basics that you'll need to start fitting custom soft contact lenses is the most important is just an awareness of what's out there. I think that as clinicians, we are so busy with our patients. We um, are dealing with the medical side of their eyes and specialty contact lenses and hard lenses and soft lenses that these types of lenses definitely get put on the back burner. And um, I, I will even be truthful in that I didn't even know there was this many things out there um, when I was uh, researching for this uh, presentation, I even reminded myself of some things that I had forgotten that I was like planning to do five years ago. And um, 
uh, didn't. So, <laughs> so definitely some things that like I could improve on as well um, and offer my patients that would be interesting. Um, and then I think the easiest way to know what's out there is a from this presentation. I'll tell you a little bit about what we can get in the U.S., which I'm sure you can get in other countries, just different laboratories. Um, but if you have contact lens laboratories, especially the specialty contact lenses like um, Bausch & Lohm, I know I think is in India. So Bausch & Lohm has prosthetics. So you could always go um, and look, you know, ask them about what prosthetics they offer. But you're just going to need accounts with all of these laboratories and then contact the labs that you use and ask about all their options. What do they have available? Maybe there's some things that you didn't think of before. Um, and then obviously a way to assess the corneal shape. All right, so do you, um, most people have a keratometer or a topographer in their office who do a lot of contact lenses, but I've been to offices where they don't have those kinds of things. Um, and because many of these specialty contact lenses are custom designs, uh, you, can, you can basically make these contact lenses into anything that you want. So you can have any type of base curve, any type of diameter. And when you have a patient who, you know, might have a normal cornea, you might be thinking, okay, well, where do I even start with this person? Usually I'll just go to whatever lens I'm going to be using and it looks pretty good. Um, but especially for people who have uh, some disfigurement, you might be thinking, okay, their eye looks a little bit different. They might have a really big scar. Like what, what type of base curve am I, am I going to be dealing with? So if you don't have a topographer to go off of, that is totally fine. Um, what you're going to want to do in office is take some of your diagnostic lenses that you have, AccuView Oasis, um, literally anything where you know the base curve and the diameter, and pop a couple of them on the eye and see which one looks like it's working really well for um, the eye. And then write that down. And, and um, when you're ordering the custom lens, you can and make it very similar um, to you know, what the patient was wearing in your office. Um, and many of these custom lenses are larger in diameter. Um, around 14.5, uh, kind of like our toric lenses are usually 14.5. Um, the reason being is because sometimes when you put some coloring, a tint, a prosthetic onto a soft contact lens, you have to make it a little bit larger so that um, generally the lens decenters a little bit temporally. So if it does decenter, you still have the color where it's supposed to be and it looks normal. Um, so the lab will sometimes want you to make them a little bit larger. And in that case, you would want to have a base curve that's a little bit flatter than what you normally go with because larger diameter contact lenses are going to have uh, increased sagittal depth, which means they're going to fit tighter. And so with the diameter being tighter, you just need to loosen up the base curve. Um, so put some diagnostic lenses on, look at how they're looking on the eyes. If you have to go a little bit bigger and say like an 8.6 and a 14.0 looked good, if you have to go to a 14.5, just make sure it's like an 8.9 or something a little bit um, uh, flatter than that. All right, so let's get started. Let's talk about some lenses. The first section is going to be on using color, um, using tints and designs. So um, the first one we're going to talk about is migraine relief. So we all have patients with migraines. They probably get sent to us from a neurologist generally who's trying to rule out glasses, um, anything that they can really do to relieve some of the headaches that the patient may be experiencing. Um, I think the most important thing when you're treating somebody with headaches or migraines is before you even go into the specialty contact lens realm, really figure out what is their trigger for this migraine. Is it stress, different foods? Um, it could be a number of different things. We as optometrists can really only fix the light sensitive migraines. So kind of light triggered migraines with our contact lenses. And sometimes these patients are even getting these migraines because they might have light sensitivity, but it's, it's from a condition, like an ocular condition that um, maybe a soft prosthetic lens would not be the best option for, maybe a scleral lens to try to normalize their corneal shape um, and prevent some of that light scatter. Those types of things um, we would just want to rule out. 
So this was interesting um, that I, I came about a, uh, interesting information that um, a few studies were talking about was that in migraines, the thought is, and it's, it's not really well known why light triggers migraines. However, um, a couple studies were done that were following these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, which are present even if you are um, born blind, you have... Um, you know, you, you, you can't see anything upon birth, you still have these, these cells in your retina that can still respond to this light. So even though you can't really see well, you can still get um, light sensitive and light triggered migraines, which I thought was very interesting. Um, these retinal ganglion cells contain melanopsin um, and they do control your sleep wake cycle. So that is kind of interesting as well. If you can't see, you still have a sleep wake cycle, it's controlled by these uh, cells. Um, it is sensitive to blue light. Um, and then these ganglion cells travel through your optic nerve and they converge on brain cells that transmit pain. And this is the thought of why people who get light sensitive migraines, why it is painful for them. Um, but again, don't forget other triggers. These patients should be followed by a primary care doctor or um, a neurologist while they're seeing you. Obviously, we never want to miss anything like a brain tumor or anything crazy like that. So these are some lenses from Orion Colors, which is, um, Orion's a, a company here in the US um, that has all of these tints on their contact lenses. So these are all soft contact lenses. And you can see on the left, there's a lot of different tints that, we can, um, that you can order for your patients. This uh, first one, these, the two that I mentioned, Lavender and Migraine 55, these are both um, filters that block out some of the light wavelengths that are that tend to trigger these migraines and there's been studies that these really do work for patients but i would say personally i think it's it really depends it depends on the person and i'll, I'll talk to you about a patient in just a minute but um this lavender up at the top and uh, migraine 55 you can see on the left hand side the patient's eye is fully covered by color and so you can order the lenses either in a full coverage color or you can order them in just a pupil only cover um, and if you're going to do pupil only what i would recommend to you is because soft lenses do tend to decenter a little bit even if you have a normal eye um, i would get the um, pupil covering i would get that in like at least two to three millimeters larger than their pupil and um, you can measure in any type of light, but I would, I would definitely go with the light that they're more often in. So are they outside most of the day? Are they inside most of the day? But maybe a mesopic light so you can just get it a little bit larger for them. Um, and that will really help. And so some people with blue eyes, they don't like to have the, the full lavender color over their eyes because it makes their eyes a completely different color. Um, people with brown eyes definitely can, uh, they can withstand the, the full coverage because you really don't see it. Um, so just keeping those in mind that it's always available in the pupil only. So if people want to keep their natural appearance, maybe just have a little bit alteration, that's you know totally um, something that can happen. This is another color from Orion that is also available. This is cobalt blue. And uh, this is available for um, seizure prevention. Um, I've never personally used this lens because I've never had a patient with light triggered seizures. And again, very important to rule out why is this patient having seizures because putting them in a seizure blue lens when their seizures are triggered by something completely different is probably not a good way, like it's kind of a waste of your time. But if they're a person who's like, yes, every time I have um, like flashing lights or um, when I work at say XYZ for a long period of time and I'm, I'm in lights, then I, I do have a seizure, then this would be an, a great option for them. This particular color also comes in glasses. And I will mention that about the migraine lenses, etc. They don't just come in contact lenses. They come in uh, glasses lenses as well. Um, and they have different, uh, different tints. So you can get it lighter or darker, depending on kind of what the patient responds to. Um, 
And this would be very interesting. Again, on the left, you have the full coverage cobalt blue. And on the right, you have just a pupil coverage um, for the seizure prevention. And um, I'll tell you a little story about a, a patient that I just had who I tried to use the, the migraine, um, the pink kind of tinted migraine for her. Um, she's a patient who has m- had multiple lid surgeries. Um, so she had exposure keratopathy. She had a lot of light sensitivity, but she had had a, um, a liver transplant maybe like 20, 25 years ago. Um, ever since that liver transplant, she has been having really, really terrible migraines, like almost daily migraines that are very much triggered by the sun when she goes outside. Um, don't ask me why that happened in like right after her transplant. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> that's not for me to, to say. But um, she had these migraines that were triggered and she was like, is there anything that I can do? So because she had exposure keratopathy, she had a very dry cornea. Um, she couldn't see very well. It was very irregular astigmatism. I actually ended up fitting her in scleral lenses because I needed to protect the cornea first. So after I fit her in scleral lenses, I, I said, okay, now because I can't tint a scleral lens on top of the scleral lenses. If you wanted to wear some glasses that were tinted specifically for migraines, um, I gave her a couple of pairs of them that I got from a company here. She went and tried them at home and she didn't find that they were very helpful for her. She really found that the um, really, really, really dark sunglasses were what was really helpful for her. Um, And so she continued to wear extremely dark sunglasses outside. And we ended up getting her some um, wraparound sunglasses that were pretty much airtight, so no light could get in. And this has been working very well for her. Um, But it was something that I wanted to try out just to see if it works, because I know it it definitely does work for people. Um, So again, migraines, seizure prevention, you can use colors to do many really cool things. And moving into this, this is probably a lens that you've used or heard of before. Um, There's many different types, uh, the Zeltzer um, X-Chrome lens, the Chromagen lens. Um, And this is a specific red um, or magenta colored lens. Um, And you can see on all of these, this was probably all these pictures were basically a pupil only. Um, And what you do is this is for people who have red, green color deficiencies. Um, in a person who has a red green color deficiency, the chemical for red green is slightly altered. So they can't tell, um, as you know, they can't really tell the difference between red and green very easily. So what this lens does is it doesn't give you back your color vision. It doesn't allow you to see red and green. What it does is you put it on the non-dominant eye and it shifts the wavelengths of that one eye so that one eye is seeing certain wavelengths and the other eye is seeing different wavelengths. So it helps you with your um, ability to just identify which um, which kind of hue is green and which like hue would be red. Um, and sometimes people will come to you and say, you know, um, I have a certain profession. I need to be able to see colors a little bit more easily. And this can actually get them through some of that testing if they have to take a test to prove that they can see colors, this can get them through that test to to be able to do that. And then they can wear this on the job. And again, it doesn't give them back their color vision, but it it allows them to um, see and perceive these colors uh, a little bit easier, which is awesome. Um, This next one is really, really interesting. This was um, one of the, this was one of the soft contact lenses that I had planned on doing maybe like even 10 years ago, I was like, oh, when I open my own practice, I'm going to have this lens. Completely forgot about it, that it even existed because not a lot of people use it. And now I'm thinking, okay, maybe in the next year or so, I might put it in my office just because I do have a lot of children as patients. And this could be a really interesting thing to at least try for them. Um, again, for these are contact lenses, but you can also get these in glasses. So what this is, is this is Chromagen's dyslexia lens. 
Um, dyslexia is a reading disorder where um, patients have difficulty distinguishing letters. Um, it kind of looks like lens or letters are shimmering on the page or they're kind of fading into the background or maybe letters of the same word are um, crossing over each other. Um, and so they have a hard time reading and this can last for many years. And generally these children have to have occupational therapy um, for this and uh, to just try to help them help them read again and distinguish between those letters even though they're having a difficulty. So what this does and, and the theory behind this is actually FDA approved for management of academic skills disorder, which is awesome. Um, so they did look into it and decide that it was beneficial for children, which is great. Um, it's eight tints you can see on the right and each tint filters out a different wavelength. So the thought is, is that with dyslexia, that the magnocellular pathway from the eye to the brain is faster in one eye and slower in the other. And so with two, when you're seeing um, an object with two different speeds of your eyes, it just doesn't hit your brain at the same time. And so it's difficult for you to distinguish between what, you, what you're actually reading. Um, and so the thought is, is that if you use these colored tinted lenses, contact lenses, um, what you would do is you would put the child in a different um, lens for kind of each eye. So like maybe one eye would have like the purple and one eye would have the blue. Um, and then that together would, um, the, they would either speed up or slow down the pathway in that eye. And so you can put the two eyes together and then they would function uh, more appropriately. The studies that I read on this, um, which wasn't, wasn't a lot, um, there weren't a lot of studies on using these lenses, but people said that they, they either helped or they didn't. So um, you could try them on a child. It wasn't, you know, maybe they wouldn't work. Maybe they would work really well. But I think if you try five kids and one out of five does really well, I mean, that's one out of five kids that doesn't have dyslexia and, and a uh, reading disorder, which is great and could really change their life. So this is very interesting. And um, I might end up putting this in my practice eventually. Um, maybe if I talk to some more people who use it, um, I know there are a couple people here in the US that do, um, but again, it's not super common. Um, so I don't really have a lot of feedback on that. All right, so um, our next uh, section is just on light sensitivity. Um, and light sensitivity with custom contact lenses is something that you you can definitely um, you can definitely help with custom contact lenses. But the most important thing is why is this person light sensitive in the first place? You don't want to fit them with a lens, a custom designed lens, when they don't really need it, and it was a whole different reason why they were light sensitive in the first place. Um, and there, you know, obviously we all know there's tons of reasons why people could be light sensitive. Sometimes people are just completely normal and, and are very sensitive to lights. Um, this is a patient of mine. Um, this is a scleral lens over a patient who had a corneal scar. And so if you can see the, um, the, the light beam in front of you um, has a nice tear film between the scleral and the cornea. And if you look to the right, that's the large scar that this patient had from a tree branch. And the tree branch um, hit him in the eye, didn't go all the way through, thank goodness, but left him with a large scar over the pupil. So his vision was about 2080 without the contact lens. And when the patient presented to me, it was very interesting because he was generally like light-eyed, light-skinned um, guy, so very light-sensitive in general. But this eye particularly was so light-sensitive. It was, I could barely shine a light in this guy's eye without him like pouring tears down his face. Um, and I knew it was somewhat because of the scar, but also probably because he was just a light-sensitive person in general. Um, so what we did is we needed to fit him with a scleral lens for comfort and we could have fit him with obviously a GP or something else like that, but he did have really dry eyes. So he thought that the scleral lens would be the best option for him. And it was, gave him 20, 20 vision. 
Um, and so the first time, the first couple times that we were fitting this lens, um, it looked good, but he was so sensitive in that eye. And when he first presented to me, this eye was white. And then this eye, actually, the conjunctiva was um, red and like almost squishy, kind of like, um, it was like boggy almost. Like the eye was so sensitive that the conjunctiva was constantly reacting. And so I was like, well, I don't know if that's ever going to change. Um, but I saw him a couple weeks ago and he's been wearing this contact lens. And because he's been wearing it, his light sensitivity and irritation has gotten so much better that the eye actually looks almost completely better. Like the, um, the white portion of the eye is completely white. Um, he's seen 2020. So we really fixed his light sensitivity with with mostly just the scleral lens. So this is why I say it's important to rule out why a patient's light sensitive. If they have keratoconus, they're gonna be light sensitive. Um, and a scleral lens or a contact lens that fixes their vision is gonna be much more beneficial to their light sensitivity than a prosthetic. However, um, if the person is pretty normal, um, then they can really benefit from custom soft contact lenses as well, and I'll show you what I mean right here. So this is a patient of mine. Um, if you can see on the bottom right picture, this person had a, um, a projectile injury. So they had a piece of metal fly into the eye. Um, it actually did go uh, through the eye and they had to have it removed. Um, thankfully, he ended up with just a small entry point scar um, where the projectile had entered his eye. And um, he is developing a cataract. Um, and so that definitely doesn't help with the light sensitivity, but it wasn't bad enough. He was still able to be corrected to 2025. Um, and he really didn't want to undergo a surgery. So we said, okay, um, what can we do for you? His main complaint was that he was extremely light sensitive because when this projectile came into the eye, what it did was it hit the sphincter muscle of the iris. And so this patient was unable to close his, um, close his pupil and it was permanently dilated like this. Um, and so in all light lighted environments, the pupil was just extremely big and he was really, um, it was really difficult for uh, him to see. Um, and so we thought, okay, he's a normal, he's a normal eye patient. He doesn't need any corneal help. Um, he's very light sensitive. So what would be the best option for him? So we thought maybe we would fit him with a um, soft custom prosthetic lens where we could recreate his old pupil into um, a lens. And so that's exactly what we did. We use Alden, which is a company here um, uh, through Bausch & Lohm. Um, so this is something that I know is available in other countries. And this is the, the Alden prosthetic contact lens. So you see on the top left, um, this is a black annular pupil. So I had the black cover his entire uh, pupillary area that was open. I had it covered with the black. And then if you can see in the middle, um, and that's the top right picture, there's a really tiny, I made the pupil really tiny. Um, and I was trying to do this to eliminate the light sensitivity, but I was also doing this because his other eye had a really, really tiny pupil and he spent a lot of time out in the sun. And so I thought, okay, maybe I'll make his pupil really tiny like the other eye and that would provide him the most relief. And we did put his prescription into this lens as well. So he was able to see. Um, when he got this lens, he said, obviously the light sensitivity was, was better, but that the vision was actually very dark. And as you can probably guess, it was because he has a two millimeter pupil and that's very small. And um, so what we ended up doing was I, I put, um, I made the pupil three and a half millimeters just to make it larger. And then he is completely happy with this lens, has been wearing it. Um, and this pretty much fixes all of his problems um, other than the fact that he's developing a cataract. So we'll have to monitor that. Um, I also wanted to point out here that in this particular patient, do you remember how I said that custom prosthetic lenses, a lot of times they will want you to make them in a larger diameter than you're used to. So this, this lens, they prefer to start out with a 14.5 millimeter diameter um, lens, just because if it shifts, then you have a better centration of the, um, 
of the black. And so what I did was this patient had about one of his flat K was about 7.6 millimeters. So usually what I'll do is I'll take flat K, I'll add one millimeter, and that's pretty much the base curve that I go with. So um, uh, 7.6, I added one, it was an 8.6. I said, okay, 8.6 and a 14.5. Sure, like let's, let's do that. So this is what I ordered. If you can see on the upper left picture, there's a little arrow to the right. You can see that the lens is tighter on that area. So this lens was actually too tight. And this is why I'm giving you the advice of go a little bit flatter than you're used to. Um, because this person had that fluctuating vision that you generally get with a tight lens where you blink and it clears up and then it goes blurry almost immediately. Um, and it only clears like right after the blink. Um, and so this, this patient, we actually ended up in an 8.9 with a 14.5 um, diameter. And yeah, he was very happy. I'm including this photo. This is not my patient. This is just a stock photo. This is the AccuView Oasis with transition contact lens. And um, this was also an option that I gave this patient because I wanted to give him a couple options. This pro custom prosthetic lens was obviously more uh, expensive than just getting an off the rack regular lens. Um, but I said, you know, why don't I just order you some AccuView Oasis with transitions and these transition lenses, they um, turn, uh, they go from light to dark in UV light. So um, say you have a patient that spends a lot of time outdoors, maybe they play baseball, but they're not allowed to wear their sunglasses. I don't know, something like that. This could be a really nice option for them. And this could be a nice option for patients that have outdoor light sensitivity as well, because it's a relatively inexpensive lens. It um, does filter out blue light as well when they're inside. So it, it does take care of some of that blue light sensitivity. Um, if they have light sensitivity inside, say at their job, fluorescent lights, um, this does filter out a little bit of that. So that could be a great option. And he did try this. He said it was definitely better than nothing. It wasn't as good as his custom lens, but um, this is a nice option just if you're ordering something custom for a patient, you could also order them something really regular and normal and, and they could be very happy with that. Um, and so this is another lens that you can um, make with the custom prosthetics, which is very interesting. And um, this is a patient of mine who uh, you can see on the right, that's his actual eye. Um, this patient had um, he was getting a regular routine cataract surgery. Um, somehow the intraocular lens, the plastic lens, actually splintered in his eye when the doctor went to put it in. I've never heard of that happening before, but it happened with this man. And so he had pieces of the plastic floating around um, in his eye. So he had to have a, um, a different surgeon go in and fish out the pieces. Um, after that, he actually ended up getting a retinal detachment, and then he had to get a retinal repair. And this was a large retinal detachment, pretty much 360, um, and took a long time for this to go back to normal. Um, and he was really never the same. So his retina never really fully attached the same way. And this eye ended up being... With my glasses that I gave him, I, it was like 2050. But this patient is also elderly. Um, he had trouble walking without, um, a lot of trouble walking without falling. And so his balance was off. Um, his balance was definitely exacerbated. His balance issues were exacerbated by having the, um, the one eye worse than the other. However, it wasn't the only reason that he had, um, it wasn't the only reason that he was having balance issues. So he is still, he is going to physical therapy for his balance issues now. Um, because I said, I don't think it's just the eye. I think you should really go for, for this as well. But um, he really only found, even after like new glasses that I gave him, even after, um, you know, we, you could try to fog up one of the lenses of the glasses. But I said, in, uh, he was only having relief with, um, with this patch that he would wear over the eye. And so I was thinking, okay, if, you're, if your only relief is wearing an eye patch, then at least I can give you something that's more cosmetically appealing instead of this eye patch. Um, and I think this, I mean, this lens completely covers his vision and occludes his vision, but he's able to 
look normal. He doesn't have to be that guy who's wearing an eye patch around. Um, and it fully blocks out the light. I know that even a slight amount of light coming in through the side was really bothersome to him. And um, so this is something that you can do as a last resort option for patients who are just, they're at their wits end. They can't deal with one eye being a lot worse than the other. Um, they're having issues with their balance. They feel like the bad eye is interfering with the good eye. And this is like a last resort option. So if you're unable to, and he had kind of like a double E type vision, that's why I put diplopia. Um, and so if, if your patient's having diplopia, then definitely try this lens. If, they're, if this is their last option, you've tried everything else, then this is a, a good option for them. And he's super happy. Um, I will say again that this lens was a 14.5 millimeter, 8.9 base curve because I made it a little bit flatter, fit great. Um, the first lens that I made for him, the pupil was too small, which is what I'm learning. I'm doing a lot. Um, <laughs> and uh, for this patient, he, I started him out because his pupil was fixed. It didn't actually move. I started him out with like a three and a half millimeter pupil and he put it on and it looked like it was covering the eye fully, but he could still see somewhat temporally um, some movement. So I actually ended up going to a 6.5 millimeter. So whatever your size of your pupil is in, um, you know, I'd say again, mesopic light. So kind of like a, a dimmer, regular inside light. Um, I would go with at least two to three millimeters larger than the pupil because it will move a little bit on the eye. And that just helps a little, that helps you. All right, and just my third, um, my third section is just on using color to minimize disfigurement. And this will be shorter than my other segments because this using color to make one eye look like the other eye if one eye is disfigured really, really, really depends on what you have available to you. Um, so the only things that we can do with contact lenses to try to in terms of prosthetics, like one eye looks very different from the other eye. The only things that we can use are what's at our disposal. So call around to your local labs, ask what kinds of um, lenses that they do offer. And you know, you can see what, what you can use in your toolbox um, to make a difference. And so um, my tips for fitting cosmetic soft contact lenses um, and people, if I, I will say this, if you have this in your office, people will come find you um, because there's not a lot of people that do soft prosthetic contact lenses. Um, people really just don't have a lot of time when they're seeing a bunch of patients and to learn, to learn this new skill and also spend the time with the patient that it takes to do these prosthetic lenses. It just takes a while. Um, so my tips for fitting these after fitting some people in these lenses are, first of all, why is the patient's eye disfigured? That's the first thing you will know when they come in. You'll take a look at them and say, okay, this is generally why your eye is looking the way that it is. Maybe they have a large corneal scar that they're very self-conscious of. Maybe they have, they were um, born with one eye much smaller than the other. Um, maybe they have an eye that's blind and it's becoming physical. So it's kind of uh, shriveling up a little bit and getting much smaller. The lids, the lid usually has a little ptosis in patients with, with no vision and um, an eye that's going blind. And these people can be very, very self-conscious about these. So this is a great option for helping out your patients and making them less self-conscious about their looks. Um, but you have to ask them, and this is like very important, ask them what's making them self-conscious. So what I think, when I see patients that come into me for prosthetic lenses, I say, okay, I can kind of see what they're getting at, like why one eye, that they're self-conscious about one eye versus the other eye. But it's not always what I think it is. Um, a lot of the self, uh, a lot of their self-consciousness comes from a difference in pupil size and a difference in iris size from one eye to the other eye. Would you think, okay, like your pupils are two different sizes, but they're not that far off. Um, it's not that big of a deal, at least not to me, to me as an eye doctor and probably not to you. We see I have two different sized pupils, but for a person who's gone through maybe multiple surgeries, 
they just see themselves as now different. And that pupil size can make a huge difference. Um, I have a patient who has um, one eye that's slightly smaller than the other in terms of um, horizontal visible iris diameter. So just one iris just looks smaller than the other and they have brown eyes. So it's a little bit noticeable, but honestly for me, I mean, I wouldn't notice it too much, but she's very self-conscious about it. And so those are the things that you take into account when you're designing the lens. Okay, this person is very sensitive to their pupil size. So I'm gonna make the pupil exactly what their other pupil looks like in the lighting environment that they're most likely in. So when you're taking these measurements, you're gonna measure the horizontal visible iris diameter, you're gonna measure the pupil size, um, you're gonna kind of measure how the lids look just so you can know for the fitting. Um, but ask them, like this one particular patient that I had, very self-conscious about her pupil sizes. And I said, okay, where are you most of the day? And she said, I'm outside basically almost all day. So I said, if you're outside all day and that's when you're most self-conscious about your pupil, she had a blind eye and it was becoming physical. I said, okay, I'm gonna take the measurement of you when you're outside, when it's really lighted, lighted out because that's where you're having the most issues. If she was saying, oh, I spend most of my time indoors at a computer, then that's where I would have taken my measurements. But it really just depends on the, on the patient. And present them with all the options. So there are, whatever is around you in terms of like, what do you have at your disposal for soft prosthetic contact lenses with color? Um, Present the patient with all of the options. So some patients who have a very minor, minor scar or like um, maybe one iris is bigger than the other, you can sometimes fix that with just a, a general off the rack, like an air optics color lens. Um, and then, so, but sometimes that patient may still want a hand painted custom design and present them with all those options because you never know what the patient may want cosmetically. Um, I would also recommend very, very highly to not never tell them that their eye is going to look like the other eye just say it's never going to look the same but we're going to get as close as we can make you feel as confident as possible and um, these three pictures are um, from Cantor and Nissel, which is a uk based brand they actually do a lot of the prosthetics for um, movies and uh, tv shows so you'll probably see them in a lot of um, I think they did the White Walkers in Game of Thrones, if, if you saw, saw that TV show. Um, and so they have this swatch on the right that you get and you can compare to your patient's eyes. And this swatch, you can get the contact lens made in tons of different base curves, tons of different diameters, tons of iris sizes, pupil sizes, but it will have these colors. Or you can send pictures of the patient and then that company will actually um, they'll paint the lens, like hand paint it for you. You can see this middle picture, the one, the lady up at the top. These aren't my pictures again, these are from the company, um, but she has an eye that's turned in. So what they did on this eye down here, I'm assuming, is that they had a hand painted custom lens and they actually painted on the white sclera so that it could look more like her eye was facing forward. And then on the left, this is an easier one because this guy has a, um, uh, up top, he has a blown pupil, just like my other patient, but he has blue eyes, so we, it wasn't as easy to do the to the, the black, right? Um, and so they actually did a, a blue um, iris, which looks awesome. Oh, and then this is just the last thing that I was going to mention. Um, correcting diplopia in soft contact lenses, it can be done. Um, you can only correct in soft contact lenses based down prism in the, base, the eye that needs the base down prism. Um, naturally, as you can assume, the lens is always gonna set or settle base down. So um, for soft contact lenses, these are your only options. However, if you have the iPrint Pro, iPrint Pro is a, um, a scleral lens uh, molding technology that they use here, and it's a US-based company. Because it's so specific to your eyes and because they get it exactly right, you can put base in, base out, up, down. It's awesome. Um, but again, very expensive. It depends on how motivated your patient is. But these lenses I use to correct diplopia in patients. Um, if you have under one prism diopter, you can generally just wear a regular toric lens on the eye that needs base down. Hopefully your patient will also have astigmatism 
So it is kind of a toss up. <laughs> I don't necessarily think you would add astigmatism to a patient that didn't have astigmatism in that eye just to get the base down, but you could always try. Um, or if they didn't have astigmatism in the eye that needed the base down prism, you can always just order a specialty order, one prism diopter to four. So I'll just briefly go through these cases because I know we're getting to the end of the lecture time. But um, my first case is a patient who um, they were in a, uh, an explosion about 20 years ago, and they have one prism diopter looking straight ahead. And they have two prism diopters when they're looking down because they had an entrapment of some sort. And so I actually did a lot of research and I was saying, okay, we can go with a custom lens that gives him the one to two prism diopters, but conventional soft toric lenses actually have prism in their lens um, just because that's kind of how the lenses are. But if you wear it only on one eye, you get the prism effect as opposed to like when you're wearing them on both eyes, you would have both prism face downs and so you wouldn't get that effect. But thankfully, this someone was watching over me because this guy only had astigmatism in this eye that needed the base down and so he was satisfied with the biofin of toric. Um, and that, that straightened up um, things for him, especially with his golf game and he was very happy. Um, my second case is a, another person who got in an accident, had a, a, like some sort of muscle uh, imbalance, entrapment of some sort, and he had about five prism diopters based down. So you can only make up to four prism diopters in a soft contact lens. Any more than that, it's just too heavy and it won't sit on your eye. But I ordered the, this lens, a four prism diopter from Specialized contact lenses, um, and he does get relief with it. We're still working with him because the, the lens is um, thick and he's in a different country, so um, I don't get to physically see him. I can just hear his symptoms and talk to his doctors and, and make suggestions. But um, so we're still working on this with him, but he really does uh, like that. And um, I did link the, uh, if you wanted to go look at prism and regular soft contact lenses, awesome article. Um, I did link it in this presentation. So you can see up at the top, Biofin and Vitoric has 0.77 diopters of base down prism. Pure Vision has a ton, so if you're really needing someone with like one to two diopters of prism correction, um, Pure Vision, I mean, will give you that for sure. Um, and this is just like an option so that you don't have to do any custom designs. Um, if you see over on the right-hand box, Acuvue Oasis for astigmatism has almost no prism, um, has almost no base down prism effects, which I thought was very interesting. And you know what it also means is that sometimes if you have a patient in a spherical lens on one eye and a toric lens on the other and they don't feel right and you've done everything else, the prescription's dead on, they're fine in their glasses, everything's fine. Sometimes having that little bit of base down prism in one eye creates an imbalance for the patient. So think about that next time that maybe someone is like, they're just not responding to your lenses in some, in some way and they only have a toric on one eye maybe they're having a, a prismatic effect, put them in the Acuvue Oasis for astigmatism because that one has almost no prism. All right, and that's the end of my lecture. I hope that you all um, you know, took away something interesting that you can use in your practice. I think this is a great way to build your practice into something um, interesting and having different options to share with your patients or just to even be thinking about when patients come to you with different issues. Um, I will have Fekrudin um, ask me some questions maybe that you had now um, and you can always you know contact me after the lecture if you want um, with my information he can he can send that out to you. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Yes, yeah, surely. I think thank you very much uh, for that very, very insightful talk. I think uh, a lot of uh, information was really very interesting in how could we really manage uh, our patients in terms of, you know, uh, migraine, which took took very important, I guess. Uh, we see a lot of patients and now with this COVID, I think we'll see all the more patients with migraine, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, with these headaches and all that, and we would need that information. So thank you for doing that. Okay, so the first question is, uh, 
the chromatids for color deficiency so is there any availability in terms of the refractive power are they available with power or are they are they only plano uh, prescribe prescriptions that's a great question yeah i think they are available in in uh with the, the prescription in them okay okay as well as astigmatism i think uh, it's also possible or is there just- I haven't ordered them for such a long time that I don't know, but I would assume at this point that they are available in astigmatism because they come from the, um, a lot of the colored custom contact lenses, they always offer them in astigmatism. I would see no reason why you shouldn't have them. Yeah. And I think now because of the technology, everything is available at, you know, <laughs> even, totally, the, yeah. <laughs> even the, the, talk, uh, the, the, the session about that section about the prisms also, I mean, we never thought that prisms can also be incorporated. That was very wonderful as well. So yeah, I think, uh, and, and I think you did mention it a couple of times uh, during your session as well. So reach out to your local labs, uh, which could actually get uh, a very useful, give you a very useful information on what they can do for you and what's available in your particular setup and your particular area. So that that's one thing which you would recommend. Uh, the other question is uh, about the migraine part. So people with uh, migraine will do have severe pains as well. So have you done anything specific to reduce the pain? Probably referring them to some other practitioner or, uh, you know, uh, did, you, did you go about doing something different just uh, rather than just prescribing the contact lenses? Yeah, so really I just prescribe the best correction that they can have, which is very important, obviously we all know, um, and the uh, the colored contact lenses. After that, I definitely send, if they're still, if they're having severe, severe pain, um, they probably already have a family doctor, but a lot of people here um, in the States do get sent to neurology frequently to deal with their migraines. And I would definitely do that. If you have somebody that's in severe pain and you're the first person that they see, because they might come to you first, um, I would definitely send them to neurology because you never want to miss something like a brain tumor or something crazy like that. Um, But I don't prescribe something like any orals or anything like that. Um, I kind of keep it like just to my contacts and I refer them out for everything else. But that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. I think co-management plays a very important role as as you said also that we do our vision part and then for the pain we could we i think you did mention in your talk as well make sure the cause of the headache or cause of the pain so and then do that accordingly yeah that that's what the point i remember as well uh what would you do if uh, patients show up with uh, fainting symptoms i think that's referring if you have any experience on when you put contact lenses to patients especially uh, patients who have these uh, you know specific conditions like migraines or seizures like that uh, how would you go about fitting these lenses would you do them or is there any tips you would want to share with us that's interesting i've never had a patient that had a response like that to contact lenses but what i think i would probably do if they were someone that needed contacts and um couldn't really get by without them i would probably just put them back in the chair so i would recline the chair like this i would probably put the lenses in myself so i would just hold open their eyes put the lenses in have them sit for a minute um you know give them something to drink some juice definitely um, and then once they're okay again, they already have the lenses in the eyes. You can just sit them back up and, and complete the, the exam. Um, but I, if they're really motivated to, to fit, you know, to do contact lenses, then you can still do it. And maybe their vasovagal response is, is you touching their eye too. So you could always teach them how to put in contact lenses and then they could do it themselves. And that might be better. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh... The next question, I'll just break this into two uh, portions. Uh, The first part of the question is, how would you determine the contact lens color selection in treating migraine? So is there any specific uh, rules or guidelines which you have on color selection? Um, There's no guidelines that I have for it. I think it's one of those things where it's just a, a hit or miss. Um, I would probably start with, so that company particularly had two types of migraine contact lenses. One was more, the lavender was more for like 
real severe migraines. And the migraine 55 was kind of more for like people with migraines, but they're also like light sensitive. And um, so I would probably do just pick one first and do that first and, and be really honest with the patient. Like this might not work for you. And if you're willing to go through with it, then we can do that. But another option that you have is um, we have a company here uh, that sent me a couple of glasses that had different tints in them, like a lighter, a lighter migraine tint, a darker migraine tint. And so I was able to send both home with my patients so she could try out both. Um, obviously both of them didn't really work for her, but you could def you could try something like that. Like, Oh, I'm going to get you. What if we just did two and then we tried both of them and see, you know, saw how it was. Um, but it, yeah, I, I think it's just kind of one of those things. It's so neurological and there's so little data on even why this happens that it's kind of like a just let's try it and see kind of deal. <laughs> yes, trial and error and what uh, what helps the patient best. Yep. <laughs> is there any difference in terms of the color saturation between the X chrome lens and the you know migraine treating lens? So are they different or? Yes, they are different. Um, the X chrome is uh, more of a a red or a magenta, like a like a dark red. And um, the migraine is more of like a, a light pinky, like a rose kind of um, lavender, like rose-ish color. Um, I know that they do filter out different, uh, different wavelengths. Um, I don't know exactly what those are, but they, they do filter out different wavelengths between the two. Okay, okay, fine. So I think the purpose is also different. That's why the saturation would be probably different as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A couple of more questions. Uh, sure. Any any importance of uh, fitting contact lenses in RPN? I read some other questions in terms of peripheral visual field defects. Any experience on that? Hmm. So I think in RP, um, I think probably the best option for these patients would probably be a GP lens, um, just because. They need the best optics possible because they don't have, uh, you know, they don't have great, you know, fabulous vision. Um, so I would definitely say uh, try to get them the best, best correction possible with like an RGP lens, something like that. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't, in terms of like adding prism or anything like that for like peripheral, def I don't, I don't know for the contacts. I would just try to get the best one possible. You know, maximum vision possible. So I think, yeah, yeah. that's that the best option for this kind of patient. Uh, any anything for cone rod dystrophy and prosthetic contact lens? Any experience on this particular segment of disease? No, but um, potentially that same color deficient lens, like depending on what kind you have, that might actually end up helping as well because what, we're, what we would try to do is like just change wavelengths. So if you had like a complete dystrophy and you didn't see any color, like obviously you, you can't really do that. But um, if you have just like a kind of mild rod cone dystrophy, you could always try the red lens on one eye and just see if the patient distinguished colors a little bit more easily. Yeah, yeah, true, true, true. And I think, uh, what type of filters are used in, I mean, fitting contact lenses to help cataracts? Probably that's uh, that's how would re I would rephrase this question in terms of helping the patient for uh, you know getting better vision of cataract. So, any experience on cataracts? So any any experience on I was mentioning any experience on fitting patients uh, with uh, specific kinds of filtered filters contact lenses for cataracts, incipient cataracts. No, but I'm assuming that if you got a filter that filtered out um, some blue light, that it would probably help. Because that's what we do with the yellow, that's what we do with like those yellow glasses that all the old people wear who have cataracts. Um, yeah. they're, you know, they're filtering out some of that light. So if you, could, if you could filter that out, then with the contact lens, you probably could. I haven't seen one that's been made, um, but you could always give it a shot. And we do have sessions next week, so please stay uh, stay tuned on to your emails. We would be sending the uh, meeting links and the session information on to your emails as well as on to the WhatsApp group. We would also like to remind everyone that we have a Q 
case presentation series in line. So if you have any interesting cases, what you have seen uh, during your practice or during your internship or your academic years, uh, it is open for all students and practitioners. So you can go on to the website and submit your complete abstract with patient's details and information so that we can uh, schedule your case presentations uh, when, when we are ready with uh, you know, multiple cases to be presented. So thank you very much uh, for joining in. Stay home, stay safe, and a very happy Independence Day to the uh, Malaysian uh, attendees today. Tomorrow, there is, uh, I, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it's the 63rd uh, Independence Day for Malaysia. So a very happy Independence Day uh, to, to everyone who is attending. And be home, take care, a happy Onam as well. Thank you. Some attendee just mentioned that there is uh, Onam going on as well. So a lot of festive season is going on. Ganesh Chaturthi is also going on. So enjoy the festive season. Uh, but then make sure that you stay safe. Uh, please uh, make sure that you stay safe. See you all next week. Take care and thank you to our speaker as well for today. It's a very early morning for her and we appreciate the efforts and the information shared uh, by the speaker. So thank you all. See you all next week. Bye-bye.